I'm Travis Brown, founder and CEO of Mojo Up Marketing and Media. And this is my podcast, where I talk to the most successful black and brown business executives who've broken through the barriers of today's business culture. Welcome to the Diverse and Talented Podcast. I'm your host, Travis Brown, and today I have a special guest with me who's on the battlefield fighting what I call the good fight uh, in diversity, equity, inclusion. She works for One America, the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer, Kim Thomas. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I got to start with uh, something cool I saw, is you are a Boilermaker. Yes. So uh, how did you get to Purdue? Why did you choose Purdue? Um, so in Gary, it is um, predominantly black, and so my whole... Year, all my years of school, elementary school, middle school, high school, I would say it's probably like 99% black. And at one point I thought I would go to an HBCU, but I thought that was my experience my whole life. Mm. So I thought, I heard they said I'm a minority. Let me <laughs> experience this, right. um, what real life will be like for me. So um, I, I decided to go to Purdue, but I actually, leading up to that, um, the summer, I think after my eighth grade year, I'd gone to summer programs. I was going to be an engineer, but I went to engineering programs from eighth grade till about 11th grade until I switched to the business side of things. Hmm. And, and, and from Gary Roosevelt High School, right? So you get black and gold then and, car and car gold. carried on your carried on your black and gold <laughs> all, all the way to Purdue. Um, so uh, what was your what was your experience like at Purdue? I'm just curious now. I had a ball. So I, I started on a program called BOP or Business Opportunity Program, which a lot of people mm -hmm. know. So shout out to all the boppers out there. Yeah. Um, but it was a program that was designed to help um, students of color, particularly black students at that time, to experience college like ahead of mm -hmm. everyone else. So it was like 12 credit hours. I think you got during the summer before your your freshman year would have normally mm -hmm. started. So there were 30 some people on that per, in that program. And we just became instantly close. And um, that group is still like stays in contact and is close to this day all these years later. Mm -hmm. But um, my experience was great, I think, because I had that support system. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just a really great school overall. So was it the culture shock, you know, going from Gary go to Purdue, uh, predominantly black to predominantly white? Was it culture shock for you? There was culture shock. So if mm -hmm. I did not have that support system, mm -hmm. I don't know that I would have made it. So mm -hmm. a lot of students that I knew that came from Gary that didn't have such a support system actually for that reason left. Yeah. And so you, you graduate from Purdue uh, and then take us on your journey because you know today you have a big title, a big role and making a big impact. And I think for a lot of people, they see people with a C-suite title and it's kind of like, oh, I want that. But there's a journey. You mm -hmm. didn't just get out of Purdue one day and you have that the next day. So what was your journey like to get from like mm -hmm. from graduating, the jobs you had to take, the ladders you had to climb to get kind of get to where you are today? I, I started in HR and I actually had a great experience in that. I started in a role that some people have to work to get towards. Like I was in the right place at the right time. But I was a campus recruiter right out the gate. And mm -hmm. I also dealt with like um, I was an HR business partner, social relations. But it was a fun job because I got to work with students who were not that far off from me uh, in terms of age. And most of my career is in human resources. So from there, um, I went on, that was at R.R. Donnelly and Sons in Crawfordsville. Um, and another then, culture shock. Another, yes, another culture shock. And I, I believe if I have the numbers correctly, there were about 3,700 people that work there and about 37 people of color, of any color, of any level. So... Yes, I, I would have actually. I, that, that actually is, is a more positive number than I would have thought. You know, mm. um, growing up in, in Lafayette, West Lafayette, where I'm from, yes. knowing Crawfordsville, um, and, and so so if our CEO is uh, from Crawfordsville, actually, uh, mm. but but. Are all Donnelly, and then what happened? Um, so then I ended up having my daughter, and I stayed off work for a while. She um, had a lot of health issues. Um, it was like about six months that I was off work, so it wasn't very long um, because I needed to get back to work. Um, then I ended up at Roche. Uh, no, Roche Diagnostics, and I stayed there for about seven years, but I moved in to a contract role because I wanted to see if I could balance this whole, not just motherhood, but mother of a child with special needs thing before I committed. And I was able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was a recruiter, I was um, a project manager, and then at one point, 
um, I got asked to, can you put us on some of those diverse um, site diversity websites. And I had a vision that was bigger than that. I mm. literally dreamed of being in the meeting with the CEO talking about diversity. And that ended up becoming my role diversity. And I ended up in a room with the CEO. Is that, <laughs> well, and, and, and take me back to that time, because the way you even, the way they approached you with that was kind of like, okay, this is a new thing that we need mm -hmm. to to really talk about. Because your journey in this uh, diversity, equity, inclusion uh, is so relevant to, to today but it hasn't always been common practice to even have the conversation. So go back to that time, you know, at, at a company that was like, hey, we kind of need to do this. What were you trying to do with it then, you know, versus what we get, we'll get to about what you get to do now? Yeah, I just wanted, it, I used to joke about, let's use the D word, diversity, because mm -hmm. it wasn't, we weren't even talking about equity and inclusion, just diversity. And so just having a conversation about it and understanding that there were different needs for different um, audiences and populations in the organization because of just whether they were barriers, we just didn't take them into consideration. Um, and so we um, had like, I remember we had a, re a reverse mentoring program. So um, at that time, and I think they still had this, they had a resource group, business resource group um, called Read Roche Employees of African Descent. And it actually started in the pharma division that was out East Coast. And then we borrowed it and put it here in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. And they were successful. They uh, provided mentoring opportunities, et cetera. Um, but it was pretty some, some basic level things that we were doing and then making sure we were showing up in the places where diverse candidates were likely to be found. And I was excited to share that um, we found a vice president, um, a black male who stayed there for, can I shout him out? Mm -hmm. Rod Cotton. <laughs> but he stayed there for a very long time, I think 20 some years wow. plus. Um, but after that, they were like, you can find executives that are black there. So we um, hmm. continue to show up at that at that conference, National Association of Black MBAs. Hmm. But it's interesting the way you said you said that, and, and, and no shade to any company organization mm -hmm. out there, but it's kind of like there's been this mindset shift that's like, oh, you can find black executives mm -hmm. as if they didn't exist. You know, think about that time, and even even in a little bit today, is it that companies out there? just don't want to spend the time and energy to find them or do they just not exist? I think that it's a little bit of both and and it is no shade to anyone, <laughs> but um, it, because sometimes you, the broader company will say, yes, we know we want to do this, but you have to have the leaders that are doing the hiring to be engaged in that process mm -hmm. of hiring and bought in to it may take some extra time because I need to broaden the pool or broaden the sources that I normally go to. Um, it is also true that sometimes there are not candidates that exist in the form that we necessarily want them to be in. And I think about what I mean by that is this. Um, I'm in the financial services industry and there's not a lot of racial diversity across the industry in, in different um, specialized roles. And so if we want someone that's got decades of experience and all these different things that we traditionally see, you may not find that. But if we hire based on competencies, not meaning that you're lowering any standards, but does this person possess the competencies that would make them successful, that does exist. Mm -hmm. And I, I probably should have done this just from to, to a level set perspective here. Uh, uh, why don't you just unpack how your definition or how you see what diversity, equity, inclusion actually is. Yeah, so um, diversity is really in the basic form. It's, it's differences and similarities, but what makes us who we are? Um, there inter and intersectionality there. I'm a woman, I'm black, I'm over 40. Um, like all of those <laughs> different aspects um, of diversity that make us who we are. And then equity is really around ensuring that people have the opportunity to have access to the same things. Um, and if I just gave a quick example, we have a program called Pathways um, at One America. And what we do is we target specific zip codes, um, low income zip codes, um, where students may not have access to certain programs, maybe like a Carmel High School. And so we help um, provide them with training, we provide them with access so that they can compete when they're out of school for the, some of those same roles. Mm -hmm. And inclusion is really uh, allowing a space for, mm -hmm. not creating a space and allowing and enabling a space for people to come together with all these different mm -hmm. backgrounds and still be able to be successful. Um, I'm gonna come back to those three definitions in a minute because I think 
we're polarized in America today mm -hmm. on, on what those mean and where they should live. But you're, you're finishing up at Roche and is Anthem next then? Anthem was next now, I think Elevance. Um, yeah. And they, I was there for 11 years. So yeah, I'll keep that at my age there. But I was in HR um, pretty much the whole time. And I did assist a little bit um, with our chief diversity officer that was there. But most of my role was, um, I was in the business HR business partner space. Um, and then I met um, Karen Surratt, who I work with now. Now. And she was a life changing force in my life because she saw me in a way that others did not see me. Mm -hmm. And I think people made assumptions about what I was and not able to do because I had have a daughter with special needs. Mm -hmm. And she saw past that and was like, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to be able to be yeah. successful and, and rise up just like everyone else. Mm -hmm. And she created that space and I was able to do that. Is it amazing that the, the difference in, in life changing situations is a person that sees you for what they believe you can be yes you know versus where you are or even things that are covered up that they may not they may not know right. and i think part of this whole advocacy is how can we be that for so many other people mm -hmm. and in hr today i feel like there's some there's some handcuffs <laughs> that prevent that is that is that accurate um, I'm saying and what go on with that well I, I think that in some cases like i'm a small business owner mm -hmm. I, I have the ability to just think about who we want, to think about what is missing based upon, um, for our diversity, we're always talking about diverse and talented. Mm -hmm. So uh, first and foremost, we're a black owned company, mm -hmm. but we have racial diversity. Yes. We have um, age diversity. Mm -hmm. We have male, female diversity. Um, we have some socioeconomic origin diversity. Mm -hmm. um, and so, Although we are diverse, um, there are certain, you know, I, I think areas that we're not diverse in. Mm -hmm. But the reason why I say this, I can say, and I did this a long time ago. I remember we we had a, we had two two male videographers, mm -hmm. and I'm like, I won't hire another male videographer. Mm -hmm. We need a female mm -hmm. because we need the diversity to have a different perspective to do things differently. What I mean by handcuffs is, in some cases, some places say we, we're yeah. not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. Like we have mm -hmm. handcuffs, mm -hmm. and maybe I'm supposed to have them, but a mm -hmm. small business, maybe I, I don't. Yeah. But I feel like are there some handcuffs that prevent that or is there legitimate ways that you get around that? I think there are more handcuffs being introduced to the equation now, especially um, they're just there's just I've used the phrase that diversity is um, on the attack to right. some, some degree because people misunderstand or misinterpret what you're trying to do. And it's really creating access and opportunity for all. So I do think when that comes into play it starts a fear of some organizations and some leaders because they don't want to lean into that. And they're afraid I'm going to get sued or I'm going to be um, perceived as doing something wrong or unfair. And so, yeah, it's it's more difficult in this space mm -hmm. than it, I think it has been in the last decade even. You know, I think for, for a long time, people did preach diversity like you mm -hmm. talked about, which is like, you know, and diversity meant like more equality. You know, it's kind of mm -hmm. like there's a translation to go on. We went, we we're on this like, Everybody needs equal access. Mm -hmm. And then we realize, well, well, hold on, that's not necessarily accurate. And then we get on this topic of equity. Mm -hmm. And equity is making people feel some sorts of ways. <laughs> why is equity so important? And then why is it such a challenge you know, for people to understand that? Because we all come to the table with something different. And there are places where I would say I have some privilege. We all have privilege in, in, in different forms. Yeah. Um, and right now, the role that I'm in, I have some privilege maybe that other people don't have. But we all come to the table with something different. And because of that, if you think about we're all kind of on a, you know, let's say we're racing on the starting line, we're all in a different place. And so how do we create opportunities for us to be able to compete? And we all have opportunities yeah. to have those opportunities mm -hmm. that are ahead of us. And so um, I think that sometimes it's misinterpreted as I'm giving you something and I'm taking away something from someone else. And that's not what it's meant to be. Mm -hmm. It is meant to be that I'm going to help this individual to be able to start at the same spot in the starting line. Mm -hmm. But after that, you both have to compete in the race. Mm -hmm. So um, the misinterpretation of it, I think, is what causes some of the obstacles. I heard the other day, the, for me, was maybe the best analogy that I've heard about equity. And, and the person was telling me this said, you know, equity is like if, you, if your kids are at school and we're serving peanut butter sandwiches for lunch. Um, Equality is everybody gets the peanut butter yes, sandwich, right? Yes. But equity is your kid has a peanut allergy. Mm -hmm. And so because of that situation, we, we say, hey, it's not really good or beneficial 
to give your kid that same thing that everybody else is getting. They have a need that is slightly different right. that we need to be aware of that allows them to show up in the space of school and still operate. Because if you don't, you mm -hmm. give them the same thing, it doesn't work for them. In fact, it could possibly kill them, right? right? I, I heard that and mm -hmm. I just thought, <laughs> Right. For the people that are like, uh, you know, they don't get equity. I'm like, that's all we're doing is trying to that's make sure that people get the right thing that, that, that they can, they can, they can survive with. Right. Yes. In the workplace right now, how, how are good companies working through trying to provide equitable opportunities? Um, so this, <laughs> and I, you know, as you said, I'm in this space every day and I have had to rethink how things are positioned. It does not, um, and to ensure that we are being inclusive of others, because if you have programs now that says it's for this women's program, like, okay, well, what about the men? You can have 99% men in a function and go, but we're gonna have this development program so women can have access to like, but that's not fair. And of course, that's not everyone, but there are some who are in the attack that say that. And so um, really the way we um, move through it now is to, to make sure that if we have something available, if we're developing people, everybody has the opportunity um, to be a part of it in some way or can have access to that. But at the end of the day, we still know there's a need um, for this group or this group or this group because they're at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And we want to just make sure that they're included. Yeah. They're included. Um, and it, we might have to put more people that are included so that we increase the odds that we'll see more diversity yeah. um, in different roles and positions. So I think about, for instance, um, some of our leaders participated in a program called the Black Executive Leadership Program. And, um, and I know that program is evolving because of scrutiny. But we had um, three leaders participate one year, where if you look at any given year, that probably we might have put, you know, a couple of leaders in a broader program where there was probably less diversity because there's fewer black leaders that are even available to participate in the broader program. Mm -hmm. But putting those three in together at the same time actually did something that was pretty phenomenal because not only did they develop this structure and support system for themselves, they became a structure and support system for other people, mm -hmm. black leaders, but other leaders and other associates in general, um, which I think has helped um, the overall organization. Yeah. Um, and, we, and we talk a lot about in this ec diversity and equity inclusion race about it being a race thing, mm -hmm. right? And, and, but there's so many things outside so of race, many. right? You've mentioned being a mother of a mm -hmm. child with special needs. Uh, so how has that impacted the way that you look at diversity, equity, and inclusion? Oh, so many different ways. <laughs> In my personal life, just how I see the world. Um, one, that it's, it is be beyond race. Um, but I, if I just even take my own personal experiences, I read early on that I was that a mother or a parent and I became a single mother at one point of, of a child with special needs that so you just won't have a career. Look, I read all these blogs and things. And it says you won't have a career. So I, so I, um, I read um, that and I said, that's not going to be me. I'm going to make sure that I put everything forward and, and I, I'm able to compete. Now I have the empathy um, to look at others mm -hmm. who um, may be in a similar situation or just mm -hmm. parents, et cetera. Just know that sometimes you just sometimes your day is just not going to go right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes your month isn't going to go right because you got all these different things happening and people can judge you in that moment and say, Kim is not um, committed because she wasn't at this thing. And so it actually made me a, a better, I think, HR partner because I could look beyond a moment. I could look beyond the bias that maybe somebody placed on someone because they saw something in a moment in time and really help people to see the full story of what someone was able to contribute. You know, I, I think about, you know, my world my, and my progression as a, as a parent and, you know, know the challenge that I've had. Just, be, just, just being a parent and trying to, um, you know, put myself in a situation in this corporate environment. As a black female, in the corporate ladder, often there's more eyes on you, um, trying to figure out how to show up at the extra things, how to do a little bit more. I, I wanna talk about two parts. The first one is, is what does that journey look like for you um, at the corporate side of this, the battle, the challenge to get to where you are. Mm -hmm. um, have there been some situations that you really doubted your ability to get there based upon some of the circumstances? Yeah, you know, I, I am, I will say this, I'm very um, fortunate in that I have just 
a support system that's out of this world and they come from various backgrounds and it starts with um, my CEO and that executive team and others. So there are many people, white men, white women, black men, black, all that are supporting me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I remember the moment I joined the company as a AVP, which is assistant vice president. And I was leading a project that was really looking at um, reshaping our entire career and compensation framework to make sure that there was equity for everyone, to make sure that people had the roles and the titles and the levels that were um, corresponded to the work that they did. Mm -hmm. That was like a $7 million project that I, that I led um, with my team. And so that was daunting, just wow. even leading that. Like, am I really the one to do this? Typically, you see like consultants or what have you. But Karen believed in me. Her her leader, um, her the team believed in us, and we were able to move that work forward. And at the end of that, when the, the roles were leveled, and I saw that my title was not going to be vice president, this little girl from Gary, Indiana. Like that was a moment um, for me, and I still don't take it for granted. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't also don't lead with my title, and I will have people, particularly other um, people of color, say sometimes you should mm -hmm. <laughs> because you earn that, and it is a big deal. And when you show up in spaces and have your voice out there, and they see that you are relatable and that you have a journey that is similar to theirs, that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think too sometimes you, when you're you're. You, I went through a phase where I wanted to be in the room, but I, I, I didn't want to be noticed because I was black in the room. Mm -hmm. And so then you kind of downplay some of those things. And now I'm in a space where it's like, no, I, I want to make sure that people understand you can be black in the room. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of went through different phases of how I had to do that. Sounds like, like there's some phasing in there where you're like, man, to, to get that seat at that table and the different tables that you're at, it's a journey, but it's also like, no, I am here. Yeah. And so now that you are at that executive level, what does it look like to open doors, create opportunities, uh, and and to be all of you in that? Yeah, I, I am who I am. And I feel like, I say all the time that this is the one, this is the time in my life where I feel like I am showing up as Kim fully. This is who I am. And I can be authentic and speak to my CEO and say, black people are not feeling that message. Mm -hmm. And he receives that. And I can say that to um, people at the front line. And that fully is, is me. And I know that I, if I don't bring myself in that way, then am I really even leveraging the diversity that I have in the role that I have? That um, And it's not, again, just for black people or for black women. Um, it is for everyone. And just being able to speak that there's a different side of this. And we need to have a different conversation to make sure that if someone's a part of the LGBTQ plus community, if someone um, is an immigrant, like all of those conversations need to happen to make sure that our culture is one that embraces is all of that. When you think about outside of obviously your company, but when you think about where we are in America, like and coming up with the presidential elections getting ready to happen, mm -hmm. this conversation is one of the most polarizing conversations mm -hmm. uh, that people are going to talk about. And I'm not asking you to get political mm -hmm. by any means, but what do we have to do to survive mm -hmm. the attack, as you mentioned earlier, on on diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, I actually lead an industry group um, in, in, in the financial services industry and it's chief diversity officers, like our competitors and everything. And we have this conversation um, and I actually spoke on a panel on it. And it is back to kind of what I was saying earlier is to make sure that we don't have just these isolated programs that can be attacked mm -hmm. because a lot of Fortune um, 100 in particular, they are getting those letters and notices and getting sued um, because they have programs that are for women or for people of color, or for the LGBTQ community. It's um, really making sure that the way we position and talk about our programs, it is accessible. I mentioned earlier, we have a program called Pathways. We've always talked about it in this way. Um, while it does definitely benefit the black and brown community because those are who's lower income, it also benefits rural white America as well. And so um, as long as we're showing that diversity benefits everyone, if we're putting in programs that help people become better associates or better leaders, mm -hmm. it, it it benefits everyone. Mm -hmm. And and that's the way we can we talk about it and position it. You know, thinking about outside of you know the the, the work hat that you have on, what's uh what, what's the purposeful stuff that you're that you're working on? Nonprofits. Where do you get involved? Like, what do you what do you care about? 
So I um, one of the boards that I'm on, um, I really uh, find joy in it is um, Easter Seals Crossroads. And I was I was drawn to that particularly because of the experiences with my daughter. Oftentimes people with disabilities don't have access to opportunities or or they're forgotten. And so I love being a part of that. I lead their strategic planning committee and I'm mm-hmm. also on their executive um, committee for their board. Um, so I love that. And then also, as I mentioned, I am at the industry level. This will be my last year, but leading um, the DEI forum for all of our competitors to ensure that our voices around diversity continue to be relevant mm-hmm. and the work continues to be relevant and not forgotten. Can you see, you know, with your lens, uh, a time that we we don't have to have a diversity, equity, inclusion conversation mm-hmm. because it becomes a part of our DNA? Mm-hmm. Or do you feel like, this is always probably going to be the work that's going to be continually needed. You know, I really hope that it's not a conversation we have to have. And I'm telling you, as I look at Gen Z, like I'm optimistic, like they are out here fighting the good fight and they're saying things, calling things out in a way that other generations have done, but they're doing it in a way that mm-hmm. um, they aren't letting up. Mm-hmm. And I'm really inspired by the momentum. I want to say, though, the reality is like it feels like this is always going to be a, a conversation we're going to need to have. But I am inspired by Gen Z. Mm. And you think as your role continues, uh, is this a space you're going to stay in or like what's like what's your mm. ev- what's your next evolution of, of development? I don't know. Um, but <laughs> I know this. Um, DEI will always be a part of my DNA no matter what whatever role I'm in. Mm-hmm. It will show up in some way, shape, or form. I've never been that person to say, this is the job that I'm going to be in or that I want. Um, it's I assess the opportunity and lean into it. Because not only do I lead DEI right now, I'm also um, leading up our community affairs work, which I can look at through a DEI lens to make mm-hmm. sure we're providing um, support in our community for um, underserved communities that just aren't getting that. So um, we'll see what happens. If you had the platform, last question before we go to our hot seat, but if you had the platform to be like, all right, America, <laughs> like wake up, I need you to understand this. What, what would that be? Diversity is not taking any, anything from anybody. It's really enriching the, the culture is really enriching, enriching um, everything about this country, which is what makes it a wonderful place to be. I love traveling around the world, but I'm always happy to come back here because mm-hmm. um, this is where I feel comfortable. But it would be even greater mm-hmm. if we could just embrace all the richness of what we bring individually um, as individuals, as people and as different um, mm-hmm. just demographic groups. Thank you for sharing that. Now it's time to move into the mojo of hot seat. <laughs> Okay, so this is um, a series of rapid fire questions based upon some of Kim's favorites. All right. Okay. So favorite place to vacation? Um, I'm just going to say Europe overall. Mm -hmm. Uh, Favorite food to cook? Tacos. And favorite restaurant to eat at? Ooh, I don't know. I like to go to Bonefish. Okay. Uh, A brand that you love to support? I have a lot of Apple, but I'm also an Android person too. (laughs) You're an Android person? Mm-hmm. I know I'm one of the few. So I have two phones. My work phone is Apple. My personal is Android. I've been Android my whole life. So well, most of my, well, I've had the phone, but I can navigate that easier than the Apple. And, and is that going back and forth? Like Yes, that, it's be... foreign language. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a sports team, a professional sports team that you support? <sighs> Formula One, Mercedes AMG um, team, and it will be in 2025. It'll be Ferrari when Lewis Hamilton moves to Ferrari. I am a diehard Formula One fan. I did not see that coming. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, he's he's going to leave, go to Ferrari. He's not going to stay. He's Mercedes right he's now. He's right? Mercedes, and he already has a three year contract for Ferrari starting in 2025. Ooh. Uh, all right. Uh, favorite college? Purdue. All right. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> uh, the TV show you watch that you loved watch growing up as a kid. Oh, kid, kid. Um, ooh, this will be the age. Um, so I'm going to take my college kid years okay. and say Martin. <laughs> Martin, yeah. I, yeah. Um, an athlete that you're admired by? Um, that I admire? Uh, yeah. Oh, Lewis Hamilton. Oh, 100% Lewis Hamilton. Um, a entertainer that you just love to watch or listen to? Um, I love Viola Davis. Mm. I also love Amy Adams. I love um, Denzel. <laughs> and I could just go on and on, I guess. <laughs> uh, so then my question next was, was Mac or PC? So is it? Um, PC. 
<laughs> and then it was iPhone and Android. Both. So we asked that. So now you're you're like the first both I think I've heard. <laughs> Um, the gaming station that you played growing up as a kid? Atari. Atari. 64, I think is what it was. No, Nintendo 64. No, it was Nintendo, Atari. Yeah, Atari, the Nintendo 64. Okay. Okay. Um, a movie that you're like, oh, that's my movie. Um, ooh. <laughs> I watched so many movies. This should be easy. Anything with... I was watched Viola Davis. I can't, can't even think of that, um, of a movie off the top of my head. Um Color purple. Let's just even though that's not even her. Let's just say color purple. Yeah. The original. Uh, the original. Okay. <laughs> um, type of music you listen to? A little bit of everything, but I always like lean to some R and B. But I, I also I love classical. I just love I just love music. Um, a book you'd recommend? People can't drive you crazy if you don't give them the keys. I mm. stand on that. Shout out to that one right there. <laughs> um, nonprofit or a cause you support. Easter Seals Crossroads mm -hmm. and the American College of Financial Services. And so last question is, uh, I would say everybody has a start date, a dash in, in their life, and then they have an end date. Mm -hmm. and when people look back at your dash and they talk about you, what do you want them to say about you? I, wanted, I want them to say I made a difference and like by my presence and my engagement made a difference in the room and that I helped to uplift others to be the even better than they ever thought they could be. That is like my purpose, my passion. Mm -hmm. I try to show up in a space that I'm there for other people. I love that. <laughs> thank you for representing. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, here we go. This is the, the official, it's a wrap, Little Kim. Little Kim, <laughs> it's a wrap. <laughs>